important. It was so big that the publisher felt that the best way to publish it would be to divide it into three parts. And once the book started, you know, becoming a huge roaring success, uh, all and all the eight parts were uh, published separately. Then he brought out in 1872 another uh, set in four volumes. And it's considered to be Eliot's masterpiece. Now the work can be called uh, as a realistic novel. Okay? The work is a realist study of every class of society in the town of Middlemarch. So she's invented this town called Middlemarch, which uh, people say it is based on a place in, in, uh, in England called Coventry. Uh, but the name that she's given to the town is Middlemarch. Okay? And uh, it called a realistic novel because we get to see uh, people from characters from every section of society. See from the landed gentry, the clergy, to the manufacturers, the professional men, farmers, laborers. So we really are exposed to a cross section of society. But then the main characters, the focus, however, is on the thwarted idealism of two of its principal characters, that is Dorothea Brooke and Tertius Lippe, both of whom marry disastrously. So though we have like quite an uh, array of characters from all sections of society, uh, the main characters we can say uh, are two characters. Uh, the mayor. One is Dorothea Brooke, and also another one is Tertius Lydgate, who is a doctor. Okay. So both of these uh, people are very idealistic people, but their idealism is not something that always uh, uh, remains, you know, uh, in its perfect form. Now, how their idealism ends disastrously is uh, also seen through the novel, especially their marriages. They go into marriages with a lot of dreams, and how uh, that kind of, you know. And this is also part of what uh, we will be uh, understanding through very much. So I'm going on to the next slide. I hope so much is clear to everyone and you can hear me clearly also. Okay, uh, everyone, clear, you can hear me clearly? Yes, yes, okay. yes ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm just checking in, in between because, you know, in case I lose power or something, so that's why, okay. So, now, coming to the next slide, see. Middle March represents the spirit of the 19th century England through the unknown, historically unremarkable common people of Middle March. So, uh, uh, ordinary people, uh, what Elliot is presenting to us through Middle March uh, is the history of the common people as they uh, lived in 19th century England. Now, this was a time that England was in the process of rapid industrialization. Like I've been saying in all the roles that we've been studying, uh, social mobility was growing rapidly with the rise of merchant middle class once birth no longer necessarily determined one social class for life. So, uh, with the growth of industrialization, what happened? The merchant middle class started getting uh, more and more rich, and so it was not uh, necessary to be born into a noble family or a rich family in order to move upwards in life. So, that system was changing. There was a change in the way the social hierarchy was ordered. So, chance occurrences could make or break a person's success. Now, moreover, there was no single coherent religious order. That was another thing. Religion came to be questioned. So, it was not like all of England followed just one religious order. There were evangelical Protestants, Catholics, Anglicans, and they all lived side by side. And uh, as a result, in this novel, you can find a lot of religious conflicts presented, particularly those centered around the rise of evangelical Protestantism, which was a primary middle class religion that created a lot of doctrinal controversies, you know, a lot of controversies regarding the doctrines that it practiced. And uh, many of these things were from the experiences of George Eliot's own life. Now, coming to the next point here, Eliot is locating the action of this novel in the three years that culminated with the passage of the Reform Bill of 1832. 
So one of the main things, you know, that we have to understand when we study this novel is that this was uh, located. The action in this uh, novel was located uh, in uh, in around the 1830s. Okay, that was the time when the first reform bill was uh, passed. Okay, the reform bill of 1832. That is called the reform bill of 1832. Although Eliot was writing this novel around 1817. the novel uh, is set in the time prior to that before that okay and she does this deliberately uh, because uh, uh, if the the time when these new acts were passed reform bill acts of uh, 1832 as far as this was a time that she could portray showing so many changes happening now why why was uh, this change happening because see following the american and the french revolutions demand for political reform increased in england and there was a growing belief in the rights of all englishmen to participate in government whether they were property holders or not so earlier case you know enfranchisement or the right to vote was not given to everyone only people who were landed gentry could vote so what happened is that in society a lot of people were just uh, missed you know in the whole electoral process their voices were never heard so the and, and this was a time when all around the world uh, revolutions were happening people's voices were becoming stronger and stronger the common man's voice was becoming stronger and stronger american revolution american uh, what uh, a revolution had just uh, ended french revolution had just ended so this was a time when people of england also were looking for change and uh, anglican and the clergy land owners were the two groups who staunchly opposed this development so naturally when the common man uh, asks for more powers to be heard in the governance of the country there will be the rich people who want to oppose that right here especially the church opposed and the landed gentry the land owners were the ones who were very much against the uh, reform bill acts of 1832 the first of the reform acts was passed in 1832 with this act you know what happened was that the aristocracy's political monopoly was broken forever and about half of all land owning middle class anglican men to see the right to vote it was a big thing for the ordinary people for the middle class people this was such a big thing and at that point in 1832 the saw so much of political change in england now the aristocrats the landed aristocrats lost their political monopoly lost all the uh, power that they had held within their hands Here now was a voice of the middle class Anglican men also going to be heard in the whole electoral process. And writing in the 1870s, Eliot knew of the changes that had happened in laws regarding succession, evolution of medicine, and position of women in society. So she was writing this novel around 40 years after all these things had happened, and she could look back and study what happened. What were the changes that had uh, happened at that point in time? And she knew, you know, how uh, laws regarding succession have changed, how medicine had uh, evolved, you know, uh, more modern ways of looking at medical uh, changes, then uh, position of women in society. All these things had changed, and Eliot uh, understood it and wanted to portray it in a novel. So going on to the next one, I'm going to give you a short summary of the story so that when we discuss it further, you can understand what exactly I'm talking about. So the summary is like this, okay? Dorothea is an earnest, intelligent woman who makes a serious error in judgment when she chooses to marry Edward Casagra, a pompous scholar, many years old. Uh, Dorothy hopes to be actively involved in his work, but he wants her to serve as a secretary. She comes to town with both his talent and his alleged magnum opus. So the main character that we are going to meet is this girl called Dorothy. Uh, she is a very intelligent woman and she is very earnest also. But then she makes one mistake. Okay, the mistake that she makes is in uh, choosing to marry this man called Edward Casabon, uh, who's 
very much older than her and he's a scholar he says he's a scholar but you know uh, after marriage she understands he's not as much of a scholar as he says and uh, dorothea wants to be dorothea marries him because he says he's a scholar and she wants to be involved in this work uh, but then kasabon is not ready to involve dorothea actively in this work rather he wants to treat her as some sort of a secretary which dorothea finds very hard and uh, he she understands that uh, once the marriage is over she understands that the magnum opus that kasabon uh, has been saying that he is writing is the or he is in the process of writing is something that is not going to really happen okay so she doubts his the scholarliness of this man uh, and also the magnum opus that he says he is writing Now, furthermore, the controlling Kasabon becomes jealous when she develops a friendship with Bill Ladislaw. That's the next important character. So first, we met Dorothea Brooke, who marries Edward Kasabon, who is very much older than her, and the marriage is not a very happy marriage. And now, uh, the next character we meet is Bill Ladislaw, his idealistic cousin, Kasabon's idealistic cousin. Uh, in, uh, she. Uh, Dorothea meets Will Ladislaw during the time of their honeymoon after marriage when they are traveling. Uh, it was in France that uh, she meets uh, Will Ladislaw, and she uh, becomes a good friend of Will Ladislaw. And uh, Dor Casabon, uh, uh, much older, he becomes sort of jealous about the easy relationship that Dorothea has with Will Ladislaw. Uh, so. Uh, He he, uh, and in fact, you know, forbids uh, Will Ladislaw from coming to uh, meet uh, Dorothea. Now, although disappointed, Dorothea remains committed to the marriage and tries to appease her husband. So she understands that this marriage is not something which is working properly, but still she is faithful to him. Uh, and especially when he becomes sick, okay, when Casabon becomes ill and he has a heart attack, Dorothea is very devoted to him and tries to take care of him to the best of her uh, ability. But then he bars Ladislaw from visiting them, okay? uh, believing that his cousin will pursue Dorothea when he dies. So he is scared that you know Dorothea might get misled and uh, go after Will Ladislaw after he dies. So he forbids uh, Will Ladislaw from coming and visiting them. Kasabon subsequently seeks a promise that she will follow his wishes even after his death. So Kasabon uh, is sick. He he is very much older than uh, Dorothea, and Dorothea is taking care of him, nursing him. But uh, Casabon makes her promise that even after he dies, she will not go after Will Ladislaw. So she delays answering, but ultimately decides that she should agree to his request. However, he dies before she can tell him. So Casabon passes away before she can tell him that she will listen to what he says. Now Dorothea later discovers that his will contains a provision that calls for her to be disinherited if she marries Ladislaw. So that is that's a really unkind thing that he did. You know, Casabon makes a will that after my death, if uh, Dorothea marries, uh, remarries, then she will not get my inheritance. So he uh, she discovers this after his death that he, she gets his will and. Uh, Now that means uh, Dorothea and Will Ladislaw find it very hard to meet or even uh, think of a life together. But then, uh, initially they stay apart. But then uh, they fall in love and they decide to marry. And later on, towards the last part of the novel, you see that Ladislaw becomes a politician. And despite her sacrifices, so uh, uh, Ladislaw is not on the same level as Dorothea. Uh, uh, in terms of earnestness or intellectuality, but still Dorothea is content. She is satisfied. Okay, so that is the uh, summary here. It's not the whole summary. I'll continue with the story in the next slide. So we have parallel stories running along with the story of Dorothea uh, and uh, Edward Casabon and Will Ladislaw. We have uh, parallel stories. Now this time, uh, the character that we are going to meet is Lydgate. Okay? He's a young doctor, and he's a progressive young doctor. He's very passionate about medicine, 
and uh, uh, especially his research he's doing research in creating a prime tissue uh, a tissue which can be seen as the the original tissue from which all life can can be said to have sprung so that is a sort of uh, a new med- new area in medical research that he is doing link it and he uh, is from a very rich and uh, very cosmopolitan background but he does not want to serve in the city so he comes to this uh, town of middlemart uh, because he thinks that he has better possibility of serving the people in middlemart and when once he comes to middlemart he becomes involved with and later marries this young girl called Rosalind and Betsy she's uh, the beauty of middlemart and I, I mean, there were other men also who wanted to marry her, uh, and Lindgate also immediately falls in love with her when he sees her, and uh, he is the one uh, who marries Rosamond Vincy. He finds her to be very polished and refined and docile, uh, docile in the sense meek, okay, uh, all qualities that he wanted in a wife. Now, for her part, uh, Rosamond believes that marrying Lindgate uh, is. like you know a way to uh, uh, improve her social standing uh she thinks that lindgate is rich and uh, you know affluent and can give her a very good lifestyle etc that's why she marries lindgate because he's a doctor and all that so, so and socially she thinks that she will be better if she marries a doctor that's why rosemond vincy marries lindgate Now, after marriage, Lindy comes to realize that he's made a mistake in choosing Rosamond. She is very shallow and uninterested in his work, and her expensive lifestyle forces her husband to the brink of financial ruin. Uh, Rosamond is expe- expecting a very expensive and fancy lifestyle. Lindy is a young doctor; definitely, he's educated and all that, but he is coming to serve the. people in the small town of middle march he is not very rich or anything so in order to satisfy rosamond's fancy lifestyle he has to borrow money and he reaches the brink of financial ruin because of rosamond's lifestyle and for that he seeks a loan from the banker there the name of the banker is nicolas colstrode that is the next character nicolas colstrode he is a very uh, disliked banker okay he nobody likes him very much now when he goes to ask for uh, money uh, from the wallstrode the banker he is refused so that is a- another story happening parallel to that of dorothea story uh, now we also have uh, minor characters who are part of the story again hello yes ma'am. yes uh ma'am the voice is breaking it's not clear ma'am uh okay i'll hold this closer uh is it better ma'am your voice is breaking it's not clear okay is it better now yes ma'am it is clear okay it is clear ma'am it is clear okay okay all right uh then i hope everyone can hear me clearly so i'm continuing with this uh story the summary of the story now i'm coming to the third aspect of the story okay so we met dorothea who marries edward cosabon and uh, uh, ends up marrying will ladisla then we met dr uh, lindgate a very uh, idealistic uh, doctor who comes to middle class to serve the people but then when he sees rosamond's beauty he falls in love with her and marries her but later realizes that she is not Uh, as idealistic as he is and uninterested in his work so the marriage kind of takes him to the very edge of bankruptcy he goes to uh, borrow money from bolstrode the banker he is refused now coming to the next story uh, fred uh, that is rosamond has a brother called fred okay fred wincy that is the name he gets into financial troubles by gambling so he uh, uh, his brother of rosamond uh, he lands in trouble because of his expensive lifestyle again like rosamond but then he loses money due to his gambling habits uh, he is confident at the same time that he is going to inherit money from his uncle okay uh, uh, that is feather stone feather stone uh, 
uh, uh, he he thinks that he's going to get uh, money from Pedestro. Uh, but then when uh, when his uh, miserly uncle dies, he does not leave uh, Fred any money. He leaves his property to his illegitimate son, and Fred realizes that now he is uh, totally penniless. And the only option open to him is to become a priest, like his family wants him to be. Enter the university, train to become a priest, a clergyman. Uh, but then, a uh, friend, in order to be a priest or become part of the clergy, you have to have that feeling in your heart. But Fred knows that in, in his heart, he does not like that sort of lifestyle at all. But then his family is kind of forcing him and he has no other option but to enter uh, the church. So that is the story of uh, Fred. And uh, there is a woman who, who loves Fred and her name is Mary Garth. Mary Garth is there uh, as a servant in the house of uh, Fairbrother. And, uh, she is a woman that Fred also loves. Now, she's very honest, very upright, and uh, and wants to make sure that he does not take up a vocation for which he is not really ready. He does. She does not want Fred to become a priest because she knows that Fred is not suitable for that, and so. Uh, she is waiting for him to become a responsible adult where he can work and earn a livelihood and support her also. Uh, Mary's father is Caleb. Okay, they are work, work Okay, they are uh, unlike Fred. Uh, these they are people who work uh, in a trade in order to earn money. So Mary's father agrees to take Fred as an apprentice to learn the business of land management which will give Fred the opportunity to get a profession and a job and marry Mary. So this is uh, uh, the story of uh, Rosamund's brother. I'm going to the next slide. Uh, now, uh, certain complications come up in the story with, uh, with uh, regard to Bulstrode, the banker. Earlier, remember, I told you how Lin K goes to Bulstrode to ask for money, but he is refused. Now, Bulstrode has his own problems. He's being blackmailed by this man called John Raffles, who knows about Bulstrode's past, which is not very good, okay? Not a very clear past. When Raffles becomes ill, Bulstrode tends to him and sends for Lidgate. During one of the doctor's visits, Bulstrode offers to lend Lidgate the money he had previously refused. Lidgate accepts. So uh, this is what happens. Uh, Raffles is a man who uh, knows a dark secret in Bulstrode's past. Uh, so during uh, one of, uh, uh, I mean, when Raffles comes to uh, blackmail Bulstrode, he becomes ill and Bulstrode calls the doctor and the doctor is Lidgate and uh, now, Lid, now Bulstrode is ready to give Lidgate the money that he had earlier refused and Bulstrode subsequently disregards Lidgate's medical instructions. So Lidgate had given clear medical instructions that this was the way in which the medicine had to be administered to Raffles. But Bulstrode does not do as he has been instructed and Raffles dies. So when the story of Raffles' death uh, and the story Bulstrode's past comes to light, Lidgate is also judged by the people of Middlemarch. Now the only person who believes in uh, the purity and the honesty of Lidgate is Dorothea. Even Rosamund doesn't stand with him at that time. Dorothea is the one who believes that the doctor is innocent of all that he's been charged with. Uh, and he and she shows him kindness and compassion. Now, Lidgate and Rosamund are ultimately forced to leave Middlemarch and they move to London where Lidgate becomes a wealthy doctor but considers himself a failure. Uh, so that is the story of Lid, uh, Bulstrode and how it's connected with Lidgate's story. Now, what is the dark past of Bulstrode? So the 
the story the the secret that Balstrode is hiding uh, uh, is that uh, you know he was he had married an elderly widow called Mrs. Dunkirk. Balstrode was working for Mr. Dunkirk earlier. Uh, he was dealing uh, with the uh, with the banking of uh, goods that were stolen. <coughs> Uh, but when uh, Mr. Dunkirk dies, Balstrode marries Mrs. Dunkirk and deliberately conceals the location of her daughter Sarah so that he would inherit her wealth. So uh, Mrs. Dunkirk has a daughter called Sarah uh, and Sarah was missing. Okay, so, uh, Mrs. Dunkirk did not know where Sarah was and he knows, Balstrode uh, knows where Sarah is but does not tell Mrs. Dunkirk that her daughter is alive and that he has located her a daughter. Uh, why does he do that? Because when Mrs. Dunkirk dies, he wanted to take all the money for himself, all the inheritance of this rich wife he wanted for himself. And so once Mrs. Dunkirk dies, he takes all the wealth and he comes to middle March and he starts a new life there. And that is what is going to be upset when Raffles comes there and uh, threatens him. So uh, now what happens is that Balstrode locates the daughter and her child. Uh, that is Mrs. Dunkirk's daughter Sarah and her child. So Sarah has a child. And that child is none other than our Will Ladislaw. Will Ladislaw who falls in, who Dorothea falls in love with. So uh, he kept her existence a secret. He bribed the man he hired to find her, that is John Raffles, to keep quiet. So this is the link between John Raffles and Ulster. So John Raffles is blackmailing him uh, in that in the part of the story that we talked about. But it's based on the, the uh, dark deed that Ulster did in the past. And uh, we realized that uh, Bill Ladislaw is actually the child of uh, Sarah, who is the daughter of Mrs. Dunkirk. Going to the next part. Look at this. You can see the character map here. Uh, you have see Dorothea Brooke here. Uh, she's uh, you know identified as an ardent idealist uh, who settles for five foot in the story. Then uh, we have. Uh, uh, Dorothea's husband, Edward Kasabon, who's a failed uh, 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 failed author and a failed husband also. So they are spouses, uh, Dorothea and Edward. Now Dorothea's uh, soulmate is Bill Ladislaw, uh, who's a rebel, who's a non-conformist, finds a career and soulmate. Okay, so Dorothea, Bill Ladislaw and Dorothea, Edward Kasabon. So, failed marriage with Edward Kasabon and uh, falls in love with Bill Ladislaw. Now, uh, the other uh, character is Tertius Lidgate, the doctor. Now, they are friends, okay? Dorothea and uh, Tertius Lidgate are friends. Now, he's an exceptional doctor, but he fails to meet his potential because uh, he has to live up to the expensive habits of his wife. Now we have Rosamond Vincy, the wife of uh, Dr. Lidgate. Uh, she is a very shallow social climber and a narcissist. So completely uh, obsessed with her own self. Nothing else other than her own self. She completely self-centered. Then uh, Tertius uh, Lidgate's friend is Camden Fairbrother, who is a vicar, the uh, beloved clergyman. Then we have also uh, Nicholas Bulstrode. Uh, who's a banker, uh, who's a hypocrite, who's a religious hypocrite. He pretends to be a good man. He pretends to be wanting to help people by lending them money, etc. But we know, we, when we know the past that he has, we understand that he was a hypocrite. Uh, so, uh, Cam Fairbrother and uh, Balstrode are adversaries, are enemies with each other. Now, Balstrode uh, is, uh, uh, is the uncle of Rosamond Wins. That is their relationship. Okay. This is the uh, character map over here. Oops. 
so uh, you can see you know uh, what are the you know common uh, things between tertius lidgate and dorothea book so one is that both are idealistic both are very passionate and uh, both suffer loss uh, what about dorothea see uh, she wants to perform great deeds for mankind her idealism uh, is uh, something that shows itself in trying to uh, perform great deeds for mankind uh, then lidgate wants to originate medical breakthroughs he wants to do cutting edge medical research so he is idealistic in that way a passion see dorothea chooses a husband who appears learned and wise so she she was Uh, not uh, judging him properly before marrying him. and uh, same thing with lidgate also right he uh, he chooses rosamond thinking that she is going to be wise and gentle etc as beautiful as she is uh, but then it doesn't turn out to be like that then what is the loss that they both suffer see uh, dorothea is tiny by an oppressive husband but finds herself after his death so at first she is completely restricted by the husband that she has such as edward casabon but then uh, later on uh, she finds herself after his death and uh, uh, lidgate is slave to a demanding wife and ruined by debt and scam so these are the uh, points of comparison between dorothea book and tertius lidgate the doctor they were both friends okay uh, going to the next slide Uh, we'll be discussing some of the critical approaches here. How was it received by uh, critics at that time? Now, the first critic that we'll be talking about is Henry James. Okay, Henry James uh, was enchanted with the social realism there of people, solid and vivid in their varying degrees, a deeply human little world. So when uh, uh, Henry James approached this novel. he was enchanted with the level of social realism the degrees of varying degrees of a uh, little human world that george eliot was able to create through her novel and he was also impressed by george eliot's broad reach of vision how could a writer have this sort of breadth of vision uh, the brain behind you know uh, that could observe so much of uh, the world around her and try to portray it uh, novel yet like other critics he found the plenitude of uh, middle march too much to take in uh, so many characters are there you know, the, the characters that i have told you are the main characters there are so many characters so many things happening that he found it too much to take in now uh, another writer uh, who read the novel and talked about it is virginia woolf Uh, for instance she claimed uh, for middle march the status of a magnificent book which will which with all its imperfections is one of the few english novels written for grown up people so this came in the times literary supplement in 1919 okay so years after actually uh, george eliot had written this novel virginia woolf uh, studied the novel and wrote about it that this is one novel which is actually written for grown up people uh, form content ethics and morality are all inextricably linked in george eliot's art this is what uh, virginia woolf felt and then uh, going on see critics in the 60s and 50s uh, accepted the third person narrative and the authorial authority of george eliot but modern critics Like Terry Eagleton, I felt that Middle March is full of fraught with things, full of discontinuities and disjunctions, which George Eliot is strenuously forcing into an artificial balance. So, uh, critics who read the novel in the 50s and 60s, uh, they were okay with the stand that J- Eliot, George Eliot, had taken in writing the novel, uh, especially the third-person narrative and the authorial authority of George Eliot. what is a third person narrative uh, i you uh, all that will not be used when the narrator writes okay uh, instead we we will get to hear pronouns like he she etc third person narrator and authorial uh, authority means the author knows everything the author uh, as a narrator 
can tell us about what a character in the novel is thinking right it's like an omniscient narrator a narrator who knows everything so uh, critics in the 60s and 50s were okay with this sort of third person authorial uh, authority of george eliot uh, but then uh, later on modern critics like terry eagleton feel that this uh, the novel is not uh, created with so much of uh, Uh, so much of ease there in fact there is a lot of discontinuities within the novel and there is an artificial balance that is created by george eliot so these are various perspectives okay given by various uh, critics regarding the novel now uh, one of the reasons why terry eagleton felt that the uh, the a balance created within middle march seems to be artificial is because Maybe the way in which she is presented religion. Now, Eliot herself had a very problematic relation with the church, and the consequent debates in her mind about secular values versus religious values, and the conflict of social obligation with individual fulfilment. All that gets mirrored in the novel. So, uh, the the problematic relationship that Eliot had with the church. is uh, depicted in the way in which you find the debates regarding secular values of one side and religious values of the other side the same thing is the case uh, uh, in the conflict of social obligation with individual fulfillment okay an individual seeking to live up to his or her full potential versus what is allowed in the society there is always a conflict between that so all that is shown in the novel now new interpretations of middle march okay, more the uh, newest in, uh, interpretations of middle march deconstruct the text by challenging its obvious surface meanings by keeping in view that the author too is constructed by a series of personal and intellectual experiences so we uh, deconstructive criticism like we talked about in the last class here we uh, the reader tries to uh, understand uh, what is implied in the meaning beyond uh, the surface meanings uh, by understanding that if an author wrote like this and presented it like this the author herself in this case is a person with intellectual and personal experiences created by that particular time in which she lives so that is uh, a deconstructive reading of middle march uh, now david lodge okay the critic who gave this deconstructive reasoning uh, so what did he say see i put the quote there it is precisely because the narrator's discourse is never entirely unambiguous it's without doubts uh, predictable and in total interpretive control of the other discourses in middle march that the novel survives to be read and reread without ever being closed or exhausted so uh, th this novel is uh, not an although the author is in full uh, powerful uh, control of whatever happens in the story we do find that there are levels of interpretations that the novel can take it, it Uh, the discourse that is the text what is said in the novel is never entirely unambiguous it means there are areas of doubt areas of gray it's not always in black and white there are areas of gray uh, and it's beyond predictability and it is an interpretive control of other discourses also and it is through this Thank <laughs> you.